thanks for coming. I'm Jay Hamilton Roth, and I produce a TV series, Business with Passion. I have uh, three goals for tonight's Create a Business with Passion talk. The first is I want to inspire you to connect your passion to your career plans. My second goal is I want to widen your definition of what success is. And lastly, I want to give you concrete tips to help you get there. Tonight we have four of us will be talking about our business passion connection. Then afterwards there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. I'm going to encourage you, instead of just sitting back and listening to our stories, to think about why you came here tonight. Perhaps there's a problem you're working on or a, a, something you're, you're thinking about in your future, and that inspired you to come here tonight. So what I want you to do is actually write it down why you came here tonight. And then we'll go over that later. Because I want you to invest your time wisely. I want you to actively participate in tonight's talk. So take a minute. Get out a pen, borrow a pen, text yourself, email yourself, whatever works, and write down a word or a phrase of why you came. <clears throat> Professionally, I wear a number of hats. I do marketing strategy, I'm an independent television producer, and I'm TEDx Marin curator. And what all these have in common is I get to work with passionate people. For ever since I was a kid, I always loved to talk to people who are interesting, something inspiring. Because that inspired me to do better and more. And so that's what my entire life's goal is, is to find passion and to bring it out in myself and in others. As a consultant, I ground my advice in real world experience. In 2008, video was blossoming. So I went to learn everything I could about producing to marketing video. So I created this project called Business with Passion with help from my local public access television station. What I do is I interview people who have a long-term passion in something and turn it into a successful business. Since 2008, I've done 50 shows and talked to amazing people all around the Bay Area, some of whom you're going to hear tonight. I want to give you the seeds for creating your business with passion. It's three words. The first word is passion. The second word is success. The third word is business. Instead of me defining the words, I'm going to have some of my previous guests help me out. I was just enjoying life and having a boat and wanting to go fast and so forth. And uh, the result of it is uh, the patent came from making that in improvement on the, on the device. Mechanical things always interested me, very much so. But uh, I had no formal training in, in engineering, so I, I found early in life uh, in this thing, I, I could hire somebody to figure something out for me that I couldn't figure out, but I couldn't hire them to do my thinking for me. The magic is, number one, uh, the, the bottom half of the blade on the rotation, the rotation, uh, is where all the work is done if that was a fully submerged prop and the, because there's an angle to the shaft and and there's rake on the props that that only one phase of a revolution does that favorable and that is on the lower half the upper half it's working against you so by eliminating that getting that out of the water we've eliminated that unfavorable position and uh, and, and it's drawing in, a lot of people think it's cavitating, it's slipping, or it's, you know, it kicks up a big rooster tail. And, and they think, oh, that's power going to waste. That's not true. Because what makes the boat go, another thing, a lot of people think a propeller is, is like a screw and it's screwing itself through the water. It's not true at all. Uh, it's the water that's being kicked off the back of that that, that forces the boat forward. If you're standing in a, in a dinghy, a little boat or a life raft, and you had a bowling ball that weighs 16 pounds. And if you threw it off the back of the boat, the momentum of that throwing it off the back of the boat, the force that it took 
to eject that would push the dinghy forward. And if you had enough bat balls and, and <laughs> bowling balls and, and, and they didn't kill you for the weight, you could go across the ocean. Well, that's the way the propeller works. Howard Arneson, 90-year-old local inventor, only wanted to make his boat go a little bit faster. As a result of that, he's revolutionized offshore powerboat racing. Passion is doing something you love. It's not anything special to each of you. You just naturally do it. Matter of fact, it's kind of invisible to you. Your friends and family look and they see what you're doing is special, but for you, you just naturally do it. You ooze it. So my first tip for you is if you don't know what your passion is, interview the people around you who know you and ask them what makes you special. As of today, we have served over 900,000 meals. And those are meals that would not ever have been eaten if Meals of Marin hadn't been there. Deeply satisfying. Those 900,000 meals aren't the last ones we keep on rolling and the need is getting bigger. Well, how does this all happen? It happens, of course, through volunteers. It happens through people giving us in-kind donations. But really, the unsexy stuff, the electricity, uh, the wages, it takes about $700,000 a year to make this all work, to operate Meals of Marin. And just picture this, yes, we do buy food. We buy all the staples. We have to. We buy all the expensive things, such as uh, the meat and the chickens. And we definitely need to make sure that the basics, the operating costs, are covered. PG&E will want to be paid. And fuel, we need to be able to pick up things and deliver. Yes, our volunteers do deliver the food in their own cars and with their own gas. However, we also have deliveries to make when we don't cover all the routes. So we look for our corporate sponsors, we look for the individual donor, and we will take any amount of money. We will take $10, we will take $10,000. Uh, we are just really grateful when people find us and help us cover a basic need in a county that most people would believe that there is no need at all. But there is, there is an underbelly in Marin that often is not seen, is very hidden, and for people that are battling for their lives, oftentimes it is also shameful in a way, because that is part of our society. I'm sure we will overcome that, but in the meantime, there is real, real need for donations and for checks and for money that will help us sustain this. Carola Detrick's definition of success is feeding the hungry in the community. Since that video is made, she's actually passed the one million meal served mark. Success in our culture tends to be confused with fame and fortune. And those are good things, but I want you to broaden your definition of what success is. I want you to think about success as making a difference. You can make a difference to a customer you can make a difference to someone who's underprivileged, or you can make a difference to an investor. There's a world-famous psychologist, Martin Seligman, who studies happiness. He's devoted his whole life to happiness. What makes people happy? And he's found out that the happiest people in the world are one of three lifestyles. There's people who live a pleasant lifestyle, there's people who live a good lifestyle, and then there's people who live a meaningful lifestyle. The people who live a pleasant lifestyle have surround themselves with things that are pleasant, things that bring them happiness. The good lifestyle are people who do things that they're good at and enjoy doing. The highest form, meaningful lifestyle, is doing something that makes a difference in the world. So my second tip for you is when you're planning your career, planning your business, why not aim for the highest form? Why not aim for a meaningful lifestyle?
as a 300 acre diversified organic farm, who we consider ourselves to be probably a larger scale small farm. I think of ourselves, we're, we're a family farm, not a small farm, and certainly not a large farm. We're a medium, medium size, but I think of ourselves as a, as a large, small, small scale farm. I thought in getting into agriculture, it was about um, being, being outside. Um, I thought it was about um, getting your hands dirty, um, being that much closer to the natural world. Um, I thought it, maybe it was a little bit about work ethic, um, or maybe a lot about work ethic, um, but also believing that you were, it was some kind of um, work that at the end of the day was, was an honest day's work. And, you know, it was right livelihood-esque. Um, I didn't really know that it was very much about, about economics and, and, and good business sense. I didn't really know that it was uh, about, you know, it was inter about interpersonal relationships. Um, I thought it was a little bit of a, more of a hermitage um, experience. Um, but as these elements, as these other elements appeared, um, I either embraced them because I because it was already it was a natural a natural um, evolution or it took me a while to kind of go oh egads I, I, I think I got it I think I, I understand why it's important why marketing is important and you know to the point that now as I had mentioned I spent probably 50% of my time as a farmer and 50% of my time as a marketer um, and you know it's there's not a dichotomy between them there's there really is a um, a natural a natural connection. Andrew Brait farms because he loves the land, and he loves growing delicious organic produce. My third and final tip for you tonight is when you're creating your business with passion, first start with what you're passionate about, then figure out who is likely to be interested in it and is willing to pay for that. Now, what you can provide is information. You can create product, or you could provide services. Choice is up to you. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce each of my next guests and share their amazing stories with you. My long-term passion is that people who work on the front line understand that by working with other people, by serving other people, that it's actually an art form and if they do it well, that they're artists. I have taught this in places like Poland and to the secretaries of South Africa, from security guards in Houston, Texas at um, high-tech companies uh, to actual people doing the job of the concierge. We're looking at it as service 103. So 101 is what all companies have. I believe that the neon signs of service that I created in my career up until now is service 102 and the silk experience is now service 103. Thank all of you for coming out tonight for whatever your reasons are and whatever you wrote down. I hope I can be a part of helping you achieve them. And thank you, Jay, for asking me to come and do this tonight because it, it actually really gave me a chance to really think about that whole idea of passion, passion in business. And what Jay was talking about, what is passion? And I'll, I'll tell you some stories around it, but I, I think that when, when I think about passion, I think about that you can't say, well, I'd like to have a business with passion, so I'll go find something I'm passionate about. Uh, you don't find it. It finds you. I, I was talking to a friend about this, and he said to me that his mother taught him that passion is not something that can be taught, but it is something that can be caught. And I think that that's an important distinction to understand that, that you, I think the old adage in business is find a need and then fill it. And so 
which is fine, except that passion doesn't work that way. It's like what Jay said, you first know what it is that you're passionate about. And my passion is this esoteric field, the hotel concierge. And I, I have been passionate about this since 1976, and I still am. And it kind of even amazes me that even after all of these years, that if I am walking in a hotel lobby and I saw a great concierge at work, I'd be stopped in my tracks. I'd be like, whoa, look at that. They're on two telephones. They're speaking four languages, which I don't, by the way, but they're, and, and, and they're handling all of these things and six people are in front of them and they just look completely calm. And still, 32 years later, I'm like, this is the coolest art form I've ever seen. And so that's what I teach. And when I was a hotel concierge, I was a hotel concierge starting in 1976. And early on, because I, I have a master's in education, and very early on, I, I actually couldn't find a teaching job in San Francisco. So I looked around and went, well, what do people do here? Well, there's tourists here. And so I went and worked in a hotel lobby. And I literally fell madly in love with it. And so I never went really back to teaching um, as, a, as a school teacher. But I, teaching is in my soul, and I have a passion for sharing and for teaching. And I can tell you that within three months of being a hotel concierge, I said, I'm going to teach this. I'm going to write a book about this. I'm going to teach this. This has to be taught. And I actually tried to get a book for the concierge published from 1977 until 1992. I got a publisher, and Simon and Schuster published the book. And in the 80s, I went to um, Lansing, Michigan, to the Educational Institute, which is the educational arm of the Hotel Motel Association. And they were very nice, but they, they looked at me and my colleagues who went there saying, you ought to do a book on the concierge. And they were like, what? There's no footprint for the concierge. <laughs> and all these years later, I'm about to have a brand new book on the concierge come out, which is going to come out in just a couple of months. I, I went back to them 31 years later and said, are you ready now to do a book on the hotel concierge? And they said, well, yeah. I said, well, then if you're going to, then you have to do it with me. And so they said I had to go through a committee. So I did that. And I passed the committee. And then they said to me, um, well, OK, we'll publish the book. And I said, oh, no, I don't want a publisher. <laughs> I can publish it myself. I want a partner. I want to get in schools. I want an educational partner. So they're my educational partner, and they'll be my distributors. But that's 31 years later. I'm still doing this. So, so I sat around this morning thinking about how do you sustain a passion for 31 years? What were some of the elements that I really brought into this career. Because in 1992, when the first book was published, I did leave my day job at the Grand Hyatt Union Square. And I have been teaching around the world for the last 19 years. So I thought about that, and I thought, well, the first thing, the first thing is gratitude. And yes, my company's called Thank You Very Much Incorporated. I live this stuff. I mean it. Gratitude's not some cliche. Being grateful. And showing people appreciation, that's one of the greatest things that you can possibly do. And the idea of being grateful that you've been blessed with a passion is the first thing. Because not everybody is. A lot of people just have jobs their whole life, and they never had a passion at all. So I think that that's the really very first thing with it. And then I thought about once we understand that, then to really understand um, that we don't know how to do everything. Like, <laughs> to be in business, I think it's interesting that Jay had the business guy last. You know, to be in business, to actually maintain and sustain a business, you have to know a lot of things that I really don't know much about. And to be a public speaker and to have a training company, you have to be good at, oh, I don't know, about 100 things. And I'm good at about eight of them. But on the eight things I'm good at, I'm really good at them. I'm really good at those eight things. But the rest of it, I have other people do. 
And so I've learned that um, it's really about collaboration. That's another really huge piece of it, to understand collaboration, to understand relationships. And Jay mentioned that. To really look at relationships, do you, I, I will tell you in this room tonight that I could make a dotted line to about 85% of my business to a hotel concierge that recommended me. The relationships I'm relentless on. I do cards, I do letters, I do emails. It's relentless. I never stop doing it. And also, what Jay said, it's not because I feel that I have to, it's because, well, I do feel that I have to, but not for some outside reason, but for some inside reason. That, like, relationships are important to me. And so because of that, I've developed these relationships over the years. So the passion comes from gratitude, from relationships, from collaboration, from surrounding yourself with people who know things that you don't know. I did a project with Hilton Hotels with a group of producers, and it was a seven-figure project. And then we did video programs from that, and I've sold those, and because I collaborated, and I worked as a team, and you're so much better off. And it's the idea, probably the biggest lesson I ever learned, is knowing what you're good at, and doing that, and knowing what you don't know, and really being willing to know what it is that you don't know. And another piece is the idea of legacy. And you don't have to be old to understand that it's important to leave a legacy. And I think that's what Jay was saying too, that it's about making a difference. But it's about, to me, the idea of a legacy is taking the best from the past and creating something better to leave for the future. And if you did that, in every job that you did along the way, then it would prepare you for these relationships that then you really have something that's valuable for you. So the idea of legacy doesn't have to come when you're in your 60s. It can come when you're in your 20s. And uh, perseverance, that was another one. It was like. Well, you obviously could tell that, you know, I'm really into this perseverance thing. I'm the most tenacious person you could probably ever meet in your life. Because when, when I first started this, people would say, you want to do a training program on how to teach people to think like a concierge? Like, I wrote my first training program in 1979, and I remember I went to Macy's with it. And I called it Courtesy Training for Profit, the Art of Service. And they looked at me like I had three heads. I'm like, no, 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 this is really good. Now I'm telling you, and they were like, oh, go away. And so I never let go of this thing. I never let go. It doesn't matter if people tell me that it's not going to work. It doesn't matter. I'm like, no, I'm telling you, this is, the, is an art form. This is great because, and, and, and I, I, I have really stuck to it. Um, I'm very excited about this new book because it's like everything old is new again. And, and I started to, um, well, I, well, I actually said that I would never do another book on the concierge. It was just take too much time. I already did that. But a professor called me from a school in Boston, and he said, I'd like to use your book, and I'd like to teach the concierge at my university, but they tell me it's just too old. And they will. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's too old. Any book that's over 10 years, they won't let us use. And I realized I can't be the woman who wrote the book 20 years ago. And I just got on it. I started doing interviews. I started doing uh, focus groups. And I changed the name. I'm calling it the Art and Science of the Hotel Concierge. And I'm coming out with this whole new thing. And two other things. I just want to share with you something that, to put it all together. Um, last year, from August through October, probably had the best job I ever had. American Express sent me around the world to speak to all of their employees who uh, talk to their best clients. And um, I did this new program that I have called the Silk Experience. And it was a pretty incredible job and an experience. But the way that I processed doing it 
it brings together all the things that I'm telling you about because I put this book together for my client and the other woman that I traveled with. So literally, two other people in the world got this book besides me. But um, what it was, was every single uh, time that, that we would leave a country, I would write about the country, but I wrote about it in rhyme. And so I wrote, like, it's sort of like Dr. Seuss goes on a business trip, and I'm certainly not going to read you the book, but you're welcome to come and look at it. Um, and then I put it all together with pictures from, from the trip, and it explained everything that we did for two months around the world. And um, I sent that to them. So if you want to talk about building relationships, being grateful, um, understanding uh, the value of something, and collaboration. I put it all together and I just did it because I had to, because it showed how much I appreciated this incredible job that they just gave me the opportunity to do. And the very last thing that I thought that I would leave you with tonight is a concept that I call be a gift. And what I thought that I would do is just read you um, what is in the preface of my new book. And it says, Many years ago, I was giving a workshop to concierge in San Francisco, and one of the attendees that day was a man named Michael Thorburn. It turned out that it was Michael's very first day on the job as a member of the concierge staff at the Mandarin, and his assignment for his first day was to attend my class. Well, that day, I made a comment about always being a gift when you go to work. I remember that I heard someone on a TV talk show say it, um, if you're going to bother showing up, be a gift. It wasn't something that I typically said, nor do I particularly remember saying it that day, and may have never said it since. But for some reason, however, it was just fresh in my mind and I shared it with the class. Years later, Michael approached me at another event and told me that he had started every day at the concierge desk with those words and that intention, if you're going, to bother showing up, be a gift. And it had colored his entire career. One never knows what little word or action might inspire someone, someone else, to pay it forward. I recall the story now in the hopes that this book will be a gift to everyone who reads it, rereads re it, and uses it to train new concierge and inspire experienced concierge. May the legacy of this book be my way of showing up as a gift in the lives of today's concierge and the concierge of the future. So I just say to you that whatever it is that you choose to do, be a gift. Thank you.